Hi everyone, uh, I'm Mo Johnson. I'm working for Momenta and uh, it's a pleasure today to welcome Cis and Valérie for a conversation um, tied to Cis project with Momenta. Uh, so Cis will be able to explain a bit of the project in the conversation. Um, so I'll just start quickly by introducing um, our two guests today. So uh, CIS is an interdisciplinary artist, ethnobotanist, educator, and activist from Squamish, Stalo, and Hawaiian descent. Her work highlights indigenous languages and cultural elements and often takes the shape of gardens created on brownfield sites in abandoned yards between high rises and other spaces where she sees the need to restore and remediate indigenous plants and ecosystems that previously existed there. Valérie Gabriel is, an, is a Ghanaian Geaga environmental wildlife and agricultural consultant from Ganesada Gay. She is the owner of Night Nations Garlic, a small scale intensive garlic and multi-crop farm, which focuses on teaching young adults con the concepts of geography, Ghanaian Geaga culture and biodiversity through the everyday interactions with food. So thanks for being here with us and I'll just leave you the floor. Awesome. Bruce Lily la on Stachail, Tanachan Klaas Lahan Ochameo, Ska Omish Chen, Iman Tanatla Stalo, Hawaiian e Swiss, Wanaxton Squalowen on Haf and Squalowen Titsits. So I just wanted to introduce myself and introduce my family, even though you don't see them, that I introduce my mother who's still with us, my father who's in the spirit world. Um, my mother is uh, Stalo and Squamish and Hawaiian. My father is Swiss. My daughter is Sanakula and her, her daughters are Lily and Kamea. And yeah, and I was just saying my heart feels lifted to be here in conversation with you. So let you, let you talk. you <laughs> for being able to be here today and to have this conversation with all of you. Uh, also, thank you, Maud, uh, for being here and facilitating all of this. Um, my name is Valerie Gabriel. I'm from Ganasadage and I am Bear Clan. Um, I guess I'll go a little bit further and make it a little more personal. Uh, I have one daughter. Uh, her name is Hannah Yagudun Hetzerio Gabriel de Souza, and she's my life. Um, she's the reason why I never gave up. She's the reason why I'm here today. Um, and basically, I think that's why we uh, are actually having this conversation. <laughs> so um, I think the floor is open, right? And, and we do have like a main thing to talk about, but it does, I feel like it relates to everything I'm going through today. And, uh, and I'm sure a lot of other people are actually going through the same questions and topics that we'll probably be touching on today, right, Cease? Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. I'm yeah, and I want to say I'm very inspired because I got to come to see you at your workplace this summer and um at the beautiful project that you've started. Uh I also want to say that, you know, I I, I know where you're coming from. My my work stems from everything that my daughter gave me. And uh yesterday I celebrated her 27th birthday and I was like really happy because I thought about the fact that our children really do inspire us and encourage us to get out there and they tell us, you know, I, I've always been taught actually from 
from uh, an elder from the Mohawk Nation, um, Gayandalis is a woman that taught me that our children are teachers and that they they not only teach us things about, you know, they teach each other, but they teach adults, but they really teach us, you know, to be the better person that we can be. So I feel like you said that in your intro. <laughs> and it's something I live and breathe too. <laughs> is that um, yeah. if it wasn't for our children, like they're the future and they really make us be the better people that we are. And they help us to actually clear the fog of what is it we want to do with our lives. And, you know, for me, that was really getting into teas and blending them. And, and for you, I could see this summer that, you know, the magic of you being a, a mother and looking to the future, what can, what gifts can I give my daughter for the future? And it's not only your daughter, but it's other community members that come and work with you. And so maybe you could talk about your project because it like seriously was so inspiring for me. I was like, <laughs> ah, I love your, I love your garden. I love your nursery. I love everything you're doing. So maybe you can Talk about what prompted you to get started. Okay, okay, all right. Uh, so <laughs> my my journey in agriculture and and um, hi uh, hi Stephanie. <laughs> uh, the um, when I was younger, I was I was I was basically raised in agriculture, and when you're raised in something, you don't know you're in it. You just you do it because you have to. Uh, you don't question those things, right? Um, so when I got a little bit older and I pulled away from agriculture, uh, obviously, you know, as a teenager, you have that teenage angst and you're looking for your purpose. And in, in our culture, which uh, basically has, uh, I mean, look, um, uh, colonialism is such a big topic that would probably come into the conversation today. But uh, I was very aware of those concepts as a, as a younger person, and I knew that there was some type of relation between environment, agriculture, culture, uh, our whole uh, daily life, okay, existed around these very uh, topics, uh, which most people on the outside may not have to deal with. So being uh, an Indigenous per person in uh, territory, in Native territory, unceded land, uh, we're faced with different challenges day to day. And oftentimes, uh, like I would receive a question of, well, why don't you go to school? Or why aren't more people uh, able to uh, have more professional, higher paying jobs on the outside? The reality is, is that we've in, in like Native communities, we've never had to, we've never been able to stop uh the fighting in a way where we're, we always have forces on us right so honestly what really pushed me back into farming was that warrior mindset that being connected to the land would be the solution to um keeping the faith and to not giving up uh the everyday physical uh challenges which happen in every individual's life but also um, that they face uh, on the outside of them so their daily life with the relationships around them uh, that are always growing and or dying uh, so studying agriculture and and my own psychology uh, but as well as all of the suffering around me uh, it kept me in agriculture and I realized that there was peace to be found in it uh, there was a truth that was there waiting to be revealed. And so what it was just that natural connection with the land, with the food itself, and then realizing the state of emergency that most people are in, in that, in that relationship between themselves and their new and, and their sustenance. And that is what really pushed me into environmental work. Uh, where right now, presently, I'm working on uh, environmental contaminants project in Gunasadaga. And like just today, yesterday, hundreds of dump trucks are coming in and dumping um, 
like uh, lower grade uh, soils uh, for backfill. And this is by, you know, this is just the reality of everyday life and it's almost there's no structure to stop it. So it also this agricultural endeavor was is the is the backbone for me because as a farmer I am affected by environmental crisis that is happening every day all around us and it pushed me to want to um, keep going when the days were dark and and I realized that talking truth and teaching and uh, and taking away the shame of not knowing, okay, certain things, uh, such as there was a lot of language loss in, in, in our, in our, all our nations across the world, probably, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a journey of hope and faith and, and, uh, perseverance and, and that's exactly what farming is. So <laughs> those were skills that were built and, uh, and just, uh, upkept with the practice of farming. And that's what I really like teaching about, uh, the, the whole concept of biodiversity is we are part of that biodiversity. So the more we are aware of ourselves and our interactions as a species with the environment around us, the more we'll understand uh, the negative and or positive impacts that we have on other species around us. Uh, so that's what, those are basically the things that I like to uh, teach and stand by uh, at, uh, at the farm with my partner, Chuck Barnett, uh, who is also another backbone of, of this business that we do together. Um, and I know that the youth who passed by in the last three years, uh, have really gained something from from uh, our ability to uh, to work the land for for the growing season and um, and then able are, are, we are also able to uh, do our other our other responsibilities in life as well. Uh, so it's a basically a very holistic approach to uh, to life. Uh, so that's kind of the long story short. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. Yeah, and you were telling me that, you know, you, you didn't know where to start, so you started with garlic. So tell me about, about how that started for you, how that, like how the land taught you about that. Right. Um, so garlics, like I did I do all the other vegetables. I had um, a small scale uh, organic uh, vegetable farm, CSA baskets and sell to restaurants and have uh, markets in Montreal, uh, same as Stash and Oka. Uh, that taught me a lot about uh, agriculture business. Um, but there was something about garlic that once that past relationship had come to an end uh, with my partner, with my ex-partner, uh, that I still wanted, I was challenged. I was kind of made to believe that uh, I don't know, I couldn't exist without somebody else or something, <laughs> that's like, you know, a, another challenge. Uh, and I had always, I recognized that I had always wanted to grow garlic throughout the vegetable. I wanted to go bigger on garlic. And I kept that in my heart, I guess. And then once it came time to deciding to keep going, and once again, another challenge, uh, I, uh, I stuck with garlic uh, because it is, so it's it's hearty uh and it's it's a medicine i mean uh what's the what what better way to to partake in that um in that journey of growing if you can't share that so garlic is like it, it won't rot fast people yeah. have a chance to actually connect with the garlic and and enjoy it and and then want to grow it themselves and then i'm able to uh, supply them with seed garlic the next year once they're they're convinced that garlic is amazing uh, <laughs> <laughs> i think it's so amazing and i i saw that massive patch of your garlic and i just it really inspired me because i i grow it too and i i think all those thoughts i think about what a medicine it is and and everything it does it takes care of our cardiovascular health it fights off um not just vampires, but <laughs> viruses. <laughs> I'm kidding about the vampires, but can never like not include them when you're talking about garlic. <laughs> but I also like just, I love how it just grows. Like you plant it and it 
it spends the winter developing its energy to grow for the next year. And it's like, it wants to be put to bed uh, before it's cold. And then it wants to just stay underground. And then in the spring, you start to see everything come up and it, it's, it marks a time, it marks a year that passes, right? And, and then everything that happens in between that garlic growing becomes really incredible where it just like magically <laughs> presents itself after a year <laughs> and you're like wait a minute a year just passed and okay now we get to harvest the garlic and put some back and yeah. see if seeds were collected so all those things I, I think garlic is such a magical entity and and it's such a it's such a power medicine and so many people around the world know it it's yeah. not unknown to people, right? Yeah, and not just that. I mean, uh, it's a good teaching tool mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of, so we talk about like how it comes out in, in uh, okay, but it's the last to be planted and it's the first one to emerge, but it spent the hard winter outside and it yeah. grew strong and fast. And, and so garlic was my uh, doorway or my, yeah, I guess my doorway uh, into uh, seed keeping. And I hadn't realized I was seed keeping. You know, every year I was keeping at least half the harvest. Keeping, you know, the ones that didn't have any virus looking things on it or um, the ones that look the strongest. And uh, you keep not necessarily all just the biggest, you know, you wanna keep a, a range of sizes uh because my my point is not to have like the biggest garlic or anything like that i just want it to be the healthiest and uh so it teaches a person how to uh, seed save very easily um and then after you gain confidence with that you're able to like for me now that i feel confident with garlic uh, I'm I'm moving on to beans now. <laughs> I might have told you that before. Um, and so I was just kind of it when you talk to like the general public about seeds and seed keeping, it's like they go blank almost sometimes. And um, so I've also come to understand people's and individuals' capability to absorb new information and the easiest way to teach something is by showing. So when you have a teaching tool like garlic, um, it becomes so much easier to teach the, our responsibility for seed keeping. Um, so yeah, I mean, like, I think I'm just totally in love with garlic on, on, in every way possible. I think I could probably relate everything back to garlic. So don't let me do that, please, okay? <laughs> I don't know. I, I think it's okay. I think I think garlic is a good, you know, doorway into uh, learning how the earth works. Like everything you said, it really makes sense to me. And I, I could when you told me that you started a big patch of garlic uh, to help um, bring yourself into that world of of what food security is. It completely made sense to me and and everything you've just shared now. And I think that that's the big thing is that we have to learn how to uh, introduce ourselves uh, to that world of, of food security and food sovereignty and to think about you know, what does it mean to us? And, and uh, you can get overwhelmed if you try a whole bunch of things and you're by yourself and you're trying to manage it. <laughs> it's like, you really need, you need to simplify it and then as you're saying, like it helps to fight, it not only helps us as humans, but it's helping the environment it grows in and it it fights off different uh, pests that, that bother different plants. So it's a protector, not only of our immune system, but of our earth and what grows there and, and what tries to become you know, invasive onto our plants. Like, you know, we get aphids and other things that get in our gardens. So we have to think about, you know, companion planting and uh, planting specific types of herbs. And, uh, you know, what I always love about it is like thinking about uh, adding uh, like fragrance to our garden is really about 
how we want to cook and how we want things to smell. But when they start growing, it, it teaches us a whole other world. Like, you know, rosemary grows in its own way and sage and um, like cilantro and everything that that adds uh, flavor and spice to our meals. It, uh, it definitely lifts our spirits, but seeing it grow on the land and where it likes to grow, that's where the teaching really becomes focused and where we actually learn, you know, what things want to grow together and what things don't want to grow together. So it's like the, the companions, we always hear about companion planting and especially with relationship to the three sisters, but a lot of people don't think about you know, putting the wrong plant in the wrong place and seeing what happens and then nothing happens, like nothing grows. And then they're like, why, why didn't that work out? Why, why was that such a challenge? And it's, it is about getting back to seeing, you know, like uh, who wants to grow with who over there and who wants to hang out together and, you know, but um, thinking about, you know, the thing that I saw the most when I traveled to Ghana, Ghana Satagi and Ghanawagi this summer was all the three sisters gardens and and uh, having grown up learning so much from a Mohawk teacher from years ago, then going uh, as I drove around in in Ghanawagi and Ghana Satagi, it was like, oh my God, I'm seeing all the plants this woman taught taught me about, <laughs> and they so I really. It was, uh, you know, I'd hear these stories of these plants, but I'm on the West Coast and I'd be like, oh, I've seen those in this garden and that garden, but never in the plethora of what I experienced driving through both of your uh, areas there and realizing, you know, teachers will really go back to the things they know the most. And I, and I think that's beautiful. And like yourself, your, uh, the relationship that you've developed with the land and um, and therefore also with the people coming onto your land and the young people coming to learn how to understand plants and their relationship, um, their personal relationship to plants, but the plants relationship to the earth and and just seeing how it remediates things remediate the areas that they're growing in right. And it was yeah it was something I really experienced at your at your uh, nursery there and on your land and seeing how your father really like ignited a lot of knowledge for you with trees he's an arborist I think he said yeah well he's he's basically like if we and I was just having this conversation with him because like for agriculture in in a um and I'm not speaking for like every person around here like this is for me specifically right yeah uh, because a lot of people sometimes they think that you know because one person says something everybody else thinks like that but um for me I started questioning also what is uh agriculture and and also because I'm I'm scientifically trained uh you know I had a lot of clashing it was so much clashing for a while <laughs> in my life and so uh you know I, I grew up on uh indigenous scientific uh kind of uh, family life, uh, but there was the kind of, so I had like the, uh, I don't know, in, indigenous paradigm uh, versus the uh, European paradigm of nature and science and all of that. And so those two worlds becoming merged, I had a big responsibility to clarify those clashes. I needed awareness. Yeah um and so you know it was everything from like and and so when you speak about like being able to enhance the uh possibility of survival of native spe native species who are who, who, whose species are you know having that natural battle with uh, competition and and all of that but everything i think in our in our paradigm is that there everything has a responsibility, which is what you were saying. Uh, and when we learn of their responsibilities, we also learn about of our responsibilities and, and everything becomes uh, symbolic, you know? And so a lot of like, for us, our unwritten language, which uh, was 
uh, passed down from generation to generation uh, without being written down or anything, not until like in the last century, um, that we do have this really big, uh, we, we are experiencing in right now, um, the biggest push that I think any society has ever experienced uh, that has been actually documented of this environmental crisis. Yeah. And it's uh, oftentimes uh, indigenous people who are at the forefront of the suffering. And um, the, so the importance also of us being able to teach agriculture, uh, which include the holistic approach of including forests as part of our agriculture. And that is something that was uh, well known when uh, the, the colonizers were, de were developing their, their livelihood here, uh, that the, the forest was very important because we made everything with the forest. And it was almost like we had our own sustainable um, relationship with the environment uh, because it was thriving at the point that they had they had gotten here that the uh, Europeans had had come here the, that's I think a fact that is known that basically at that point in time our this continent was just at probably somewhere we'll, we'll never ever get to experience nature ever again um, so our responsibility to keep bringing these plants and, and allowing them a chance to survive, whether it's through seed keeping, uh, plant sharing, um, knowledge sharing on, on the world views that have allowed these seeds and these plants to continue on uh, along with their own culture and language, you know, it's this very, it becomes a very spiritual effort, right? So your responsibility and your, your life journey and my life journey, you know, have become entwined because I think that we, <laughs> I think we needed to know that there was other people out there that have really basically experienced uh, the same thing and are allowed to actually talk about that truth today, right now. Um, so it is, uh, it is an honor to be able to actually w put um, words to my feelings, uh, which, uh, I don't often, you know, it's, it, I think about it in my head all the time. Every time I work with a plant, yeah. <laughs> it's almost a burden at that point, you know? I think that's what plants do. I think they really, I mean, you know, in our indigenous worldview, we see them as our relatives and we know that they're our teachers and we know that, that they have existed way longer than humans have, like for millennial, time you know it was like everything was like you said everything was this beautiful perfect environment and when settlers arrived i know for like i'm my mother's writing a lot of books right now about you know from pre-contact to to now and in her in her research she really highlights how rich everything was here when the tall ships arrived in our inlet and when they they saw these massive cedar trees that it would take 40 people with outstretched arms, you know, just touching the tips of their fingers to each other to actually get around one base of one tree. And now you have to go into the high mountains where, you know, these forestry companies still want to go in and take down these giant trees. And it, it's like a hatred for anything ancient and and understanding that that has has been a, a negative relationship that has been happening, you know, for your people close to, excuse me, close to 500 years and for my people just like 200 years, like it took a long time for people to figure out how to get over here and to take our, you know, everything to take our food sources and to take um, I'm about to say resources, but I'm I'm being act, actually asked by elders now to not use that term because they they don't like that word. They think of how extractive it is and how it's always been. They've been 
you know, settlers have been extracting everything that they see as resources and we see it as the environment. We see it as like, why are you taking a whole forest out to make wood? Like we've been building massive homes. Like I know you have your longhouses and our, we have our longhouses too. And our, our longhouses are built of massive cedars. So when people say, where are your longhouses? Well, where are the cedars? The cedars are almost gone. We can't actually build the structures that we traditionally built. We can't, you know, to make a totem pole or a canoe now is, you know, so only, a, it's like the 1% of the carvers get to have that uh, ability to do that. And, and they have to also therefore bring all the younger carvers in to learn because otherwise they'll never have an opportunity to work on on cedar carvings uh, on a massive pole scale because the the cedars are disappearing and and now as you were saying like especially this summer we felt that impact of of uh, climate change we definitely felt it here in bc we felt the day i arrived in montreal a town that I've gone to through my whole life burnt down entirely, was gone. And then the next day, the news was that all the shellfish burned from Alaska to California. And I was like, I was like, I, this is so heavy. How do we, you know, when I think of that, I immediately thought of tons of communities that rely on just small handfuls really in comparison of what is out there, just small handfuls of, of those foods to survive. And that everything that a shellfish provides for us isn't just a meal. You know, when we are able to put those shells back, they regenerate the growth of the shellfish. Uh, we could also put some in our garden and it, it feeds our garden. And um, we can throw some in the forest to feed uh, the trees so they get their multivitamins. And so all these things that, um, that it affects so many lives, not just one. And we see the settler agricultural slash indus industrial machine going and it's, it's all about produce things for money <laughs> for the masses. And it's like people that don't even know where that food comes from. So, you know, for us, we were asked to start a community garden 12 years ago so that the children in our community would actually see that food has to grow from the ground. And, uh, and so I, I've been doing that for 12 years. I've been stewarding this garden and we've gone through ups and downs and we have some people that despise the garden, <laughs> we have some, which I find weird. How can you hate a garden? But <laughs> It's like, yeah. but, but when we're talking about colonialism, like I started to see how colonized my community was and realize the people that hate the garden are very colonized and they're like, we can go to the mall and get food. Yeah, but what about your children and grandchildren? They actually, in their hearts and minds, need to know where things come from. Like their little minds are have very existential uh ponderings like what is life where does it come from <laughs> they want to know like they want to you know see why are there bugs in the world then they come to the garden and they realize well ladybugs eat aphids and that's a cool thing and um garlic takes a year to grow corn takes almost a year to grow like all these things start to uh expand in their mind and they realize that it's not a simple issue of let's go to the store and buy some food. No, we need to know, you know, I taught some little boys, they were, <laughs> they were like, how do you grow that pumpkin? So I gave them all containers, gave them seeds. And I, we started to mix the, um, the composted soil with the regular soil. And they were like, Oh, it smells. And they were like, you know, <laughs> trying to not barf and they were like being really cute. And I'm like, well, you need stinky things to make things grow. And they're like, why? And so we had this big talk and, uh, and I talked about how there was actually also, it was sea soil I had. So there's fish guts and everything in there. And I said, but you can't actually smell how bad it is because they've, 
you know, let this age. And when you let things age, it, the smell goes away, but you still have the nutrients. So they were very fascinated. And, and then they went home with their little containers and they were really happy. They're like, we're going to grow our own pumpkin. And, you know, they know they can come to the garden and eat berries and other things, but it was like a real mind blowing moment for them to actually think about everything that goes into growing something that it isn't just as easy as put it in the ground it grows no they knew they had to go home and water that daily and um, I taught them to talk to their plants and they thought that was silly at first but then you know I said look at all the big plants in this garden they're all from people that come and you know hold the plant and talk to it and you know we had corn that was like 20 feet high this year and I I watched wow. this couple, yeah, I watched this couple going around holding the corn and loving it. And <laughs> I was like, it is really about infusing our love into the, into the plants, right? Like the plants are feeding us. Like we literally went at the end of the year, we get to get that corn and we can, you know, eat it off the cob if it's that kind of corn or dry it and grind it into cornmeal and make food. And so you know, when kids are learning those things, they start to realize, yeah, when I go to the drive through and get like something to eat, it actually had to go through all these phases before it was ready for me. And, and I still think it's the most important thing we can teach children is where our food comes from and how long it takes, you know, for food to grow, for animals to get to an age that they can be killed in order to feed us and all of those things are really important right yeah yeah and and again just uh you what you said was i'm agree i agree with everything 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 and one underlying uh thing is basically like it's love and i don't want to get all hippie in here but it's not being hippie it's, it's really <laughs> no. like when you cut when it comes down to it everybody every individual choice at the end of the day to either love or not love it is like that's your biggest responsibility like do you love life or maybe not maybe that's just too simplified um are are you capable of love yeah and so is it's like an individual journey as well to be able to extend that love kindness compassion um and it's so agriculture becomes a tool to be able to teach the individual uh do are how capable are they of love um because i think love exists universally like there's that universal love you know we don't want anybody to suffer and all of that but when it's about like things that happen in the present moment that are kind of feel out of our reach, what is our power? How do we empower ourselves to uh, basically choose the, uh, the good path versus the more destructive path? And the, so we make a higher, a higher choice at that point. And so it's empowering the individuals who walk through, you know, your farm doors, your garden doors, my garden doors, wherever I go, I don't have to be in, in, uh, on the land, um, that it really begins with us. And so the, uh, like all the uh, accumulative uh, actions of the past um, are always, like we always have a choice in the present of how to mitigate or to manage, um, I guess, the, um, the, the responsibility that has been being pushed aside, okay? And it's that we are, and I, I think, you know, that's what I've heard many times in, in, in the elders talking that there will basically come a time where you have to make that choice. And uh, I think we're kind of there. Um, so we need to be having these conversations. And it's so, it, to a, what I would say a non-believer or somebody who questions the validity, validity of our statements today, of our experiences and just pushing them off as if they're 
um, they're, oh, they're just the indigenous problem or they're just being sensitive or something like that. That's not true. It's just that individuals incapable of love in, in, a, in a bigger sense. And so then it almost becomes it's being put on our shoulders to show and demonstrate that love to people who don't know. And it, it sometimes at the end of the day, it is so tiring. It is so tiring where you just extend every, it feels like every inch that you have to, to that fight, to that basically almost spiritual war. Um, and then again, at the end of the day, when you go into your farm or your garden, you're replenished again. So if you just go back to the source, to back to the love, back to that uh, balance of nature, it's always fulfilling, right? And, and that's across the whole world. When people go into the land, they feel replenished. And then, you know, it's almost like they have to jump the street and go to the other side and forget about that love. And it's weird. It's just it's just weird. Uh, I, I'm still trying to understand that. Uh, so into the garden I go, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I think it's, I think it's, you're so right about that. And I just, it's the thing I hear from people the most, like, I spend a lot of my time, like guiding people into the land, guiding them into the forest. And, you know, it'll, and it'll be people that have walked through the forest, but it's like, they literally just walk through, they're not, and they're, they're like, it's, it's beautiful here, but they couldn't tell you why. And then I, then I draw attention to tiny little microclimates on the side of the path that they've walked by several times. And you know, and it, it's like when we walked through the pines together, and and it was so beautiful there. And then you were like, "Hey, look, chanterelles!" And it was like, "Oh my God!" They just popped. Yeah. You know, the color, the orange, just like glowing in the forest it's just beckoning us to to pay attention to it um and i made a really good meal out of that <laughs> it was so good and it you know it was um for me i tell people that if you want to be connected to the land you're in you need to you need to touch the land you need to feel it and you know uh, another deeper way of connecting is drinking tea that is from the land but in order to do that, you have to know it, you have to understand it. And you can't just say, oh, I think this looks like, you know, a blackberry leaf, but is it? Do you know that? <laughs> so you have to take the time to really study it, look at it and, and have a relationship with it as you're saying. And otherwise you're just a tourist, you're just walking through, you're not touching anything. And <clears throat> you know, I, another thing I do is I make people hug trees. So <laughs> I'll walk through a forest and at the end, I'm like, everybody find a tree. And the, they're, for the most part, most people, even if they've never done it, they're like, yay. And they, <laughs> they find a tree and they're hugging it. And they're, you know, like, uh, like little kids have said to me, my tree told me it was lonely and it needs to be hugged more and i was like oh you know like <laughs> you know, kids will just be so honest and some kids will be like there was a bug on mine so i just touched it with my finger <laughs> like okay well that's a good start you're starting with your finger <laughs> and like next time you'll have your whole hand on it and yeah. you know and it's, it's like just that whole thing like we we need to um, we need to feel more open to touch nature, but not in an invasive way, but in a like a kind and loving way, like you're saying. And and I believe that too. Like people do need to to lose their fear. They've had all these stigmas, and you know they'll they'll go in a restaurant and just touch everything, but not think about who else has touched that. But then they go in a forest and it's like hug a tree. Like oh, but there's you know, I don't know about it. I don't, I don't understand it. And it's this fear. And it's like, okay, let me talk about this. Trees are the second oldest beings on the planet. They've been here for centuries before humans. So, you know, I think trees deserve to be hugged, not chopped down. That's my philosophy. And if you have a relationship with this tree, you're going to be less likely to say, Oh, I'm going to just waste paper here and there because there's trees everywhere. We'll have paper forever. No, you need to actually look at these trees and understand that they're giving up their lives for you to waste 
to add waste to the planet. And, you know, everything that a tree does, it takes centuries to grow and, and uh, decades in some cases, some trees live for several decades, some live for several centuries, but the trees that no matter whether they have leaves or needles, whatever the structure is of that tree, they drop parts of themselves to the ground and then it decomposes and it eventually becomes soil. And in the meantime, they're feeding bugs and worms, all these things that are over actively working every minute of the day for all of us. All of creation works for humans. And what do we do for the natural world? Like what is our gift back? So I think that you know, when I look at what you're doing and um, you have a whole range of plants, you have trees and you have specific things you are learning about how to grow those trees and care for them and prepare them to you know, be um, sold or traded to somebody else, then um, what does that involve? And, and I, I could see my time at your nursery, all of your youth that worked for you knew everything about it. And I was like, oh, Valerie has learned this herself. And a lot of it you've learned from your dad, but you've learned from your relationship with them and learning how to, to grow those trees, but then imparting your knowledge onto that next generation. And they're, you know, they're carrying that knowledge with pride. And it, it's like, it's not a heavy weight for them, but they, at the same time, they know it is, but they've taken it on and they, they embrace it. They've embraced what that work is and it makes them feel taller. And, you know, one thing I noticed about the youth you're working with, none of them slouched. They were all like walking around with shoulders high. And I was like, you know, you can't, you can't give somebody pride. You have mm -hmm. to instill it in them and nurture. You have to just like the plants to have them grow tall. You have to nurture them and instill that love and so you don't just do that with your plants you do that with everybody that works with you and I think that's that's the real defining key like with indigenous food sovereignty and indigenous food security and uh, doing land-based work that means something to us it all comes from that work like being on the land and recognizing each plant has has its own way of being and living and doing and how you uh, how you carry yourself through that land and with each plant you also you know I see how naturally you instill that into the people working with you and to see that group of young folks really having that pride and understanding what everything is and knowing you know, you guys are all kind of shy. We don't know the names of this or that, but you knew a lot. And it, like, <laughs> you know, you can't, like, I don't know the name of every plant either, but I've been at this 30 years and, and sometimes I have to kind of stumble, but it's, I know it's my ancestors telling me, you know, work a little harder, just learn a little bit more and spend a bit more time on the land and spend a bit more time with each of the plants that really call to you and you will never have to stumble on figuring out what to say about them. They're, each plant is a story and learning each story is what fills you with pride and, and instills that knowledge in a way that it's like covering yourself with patches of love everywhere by just learning, learning those simple things, you know? And, and I think that's, you know, that's the thing that really caught my attention when I got that chance to visit you there and see how you are on your land with your community and, you know, and how the plants have nurtured you and how they call you back to that work. You know, I know you have to come to the city and do your work and learn, learn things that are outside of your culture, but you, you also like have been filling yourself up all summer with that love on the land and it carries you enough to 
bring you into those places, those urban spaces, you have to go and learn a whole different, you know, language of knowledge that isn't, uh, maybe it isn't indigenous, but maybe it is, it's just in a different language. And you, you yourself are going to decolonize that relationship as you come back home and go back to work uh, with your plants. And the fact you come home regularly and spend that time at home, it's not, you're not severed from it. You're not disconnected. You're just doing something different on this day and that day, but really the land is what is really carrying you and nurturing you and, and lifting you up to give you that strength, to give that out to, to those that come and work with you, like the youth that show up for that work. They, they, they show up, I can say, I can, I could see they show up willingly. They, you know, they're not being forced to come there and do things with you, but they, they feel the same calling of what brought you there yourself. And, and that's, I think that's the most inspiring thing to be able to feel a love for something and have others recognize it and want to be part of that. So yeah, I think that's, that's brilliant. <laughs> Thank you, man. I almost like cried like three times. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was almost crying when you were talking earlier because it's like the 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 things that you're realizing in your relationship with the land I was like oh my god I'm just gonna have to turn off my camera so I can like, not throw like you off wiping all that, like oh my wiping god. my tears <laughs> but yeah I mean I think that's why the land is so powerful it really it does help us find our heart yeah and clear it our minds honestly i i really feel that um like all around my house like i just i just have to look outside and i i feel kind of not like fully replenished but uh it inspires me to keep going because if i sit outside i'm like wow look at all the wildlife that's around my house you know and it is about like and I, I, if if there are you know uh disbelievers who are listening to this at one point uh doubt that um you know, well, we talk about decolonization and well, look, uh, she lives in a house too and like blah, 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 blah. It's not really by choice because yeah. over the centuries, we have over the, the, the contact between Europeans and indigenous people here, we, you know, you move, you can only move so far into other people's territory. You know, so at, at, at the same time as interacting with Europeans, uh, there are several nations that exist around every other nation, and you can't just go and start stepping on other people's territory because we have had our politics uh, for hundreds and hundreds and basically thousands of years. And so we have been forced in, in a natural way, I guess, if you want to talk about how the nature of people is also part of nature, um, that, you know, we've suffered a lot. We've suffered a lot of loss. We've suffered a lot of uh, understanding. I think our ancestors really understood, uh, okay, well, at this point we have choice A or B and there was no C or D or B or, uh, so it was either die or move more inland or settle for some type of agreement, which obviously uh, was understood differently by both sides. Uh, and now we end up in this, uh, on, in, in for my case specifically, we end up on very small territories uh, and or reserves and uh, with different laws that apply to the rest of Canadians that also hinder our growth mm -hmm. because uh, we, are, we are basically in every way from uh, like there are uh, it, hate crimes every single day that happen to children, women and men uh, where they should just 
be uh, free to uh, decide or to enforce our own political views and laws and not of that of the colonizer. So, um, but it's so hard. It's such a draining task on top of like trying to raise a family or, uh, you know, do an agricultural business um, and to just kind of heal from our own personal traumas. So uh, yes, we live in houses, you know, um, and we drive cars and all of that. But every day that I had free thinking, I've always really tried to make the, the higher decision and to basically allow nature to grow. Uh, and that's what it comes down to, really. Uh, and, and when we, there's a lot of people who are, who protest, um, the tar sands, the pipelines, and we're, we're doing it because we choose the higher power. We choose the higher choice, you know, even though in the face of uh, industry, in the face of uh, colonialism, uh, in the face of uh, possibly dying and, and having death threats and, and, and then no security after that because our communities were not furnished with those things. Uh, it's not the same as outside municipalities or uh, other provinces. Uh, and every province is different towards their uh, First Nations people. Uh, that one thing does not apply to the other. And uh, so it's not the same across the board in Canada. Um, and so media also contributes to uh, these environmental, cultural uh, issues which we face every day. And uh, I think that the reason I, I think that you know, we can't really, we have to be, we're, we're very realistic, uh, common sense people. Uh, but when we're, we're continuously hit with colonial, uh, the colonial paradigm of existing, okay, uh, that's where we, we, we're always like just stuck in our, our struggles and, and it, it, it's always triggering. <laughs> that's one thing I didn't, I hadn't mentioned yet, it's always triggering. And so every day you go back home and you're triggered. You're like, oh, I just want to be, what I would say to myself, oh, I just want to be able to be, feel normal and come home without feeling like I have the burden of, you know, uh, stopping dump trucks or uh, having to advise uh, just non-natives as to why they can't harvest in this territory because we fought so hard to keep our resources here and we don't want to give it away. Um, it's just a constant struggle. So being able to talk about that too is so valuable. Uh, the truth of what happens in, in our lives, but also, you know, I'm not even related to say the people who are also at their own fight uh fighting their own you know we're maybe a population of uh in Ganesanaga 2,500 maybe 3,000 now that's not a lot of people so we're always you know we have our the conflicts that happen within uh we have the conflicts that happen uh between uh families uh, and then the rest of the community and it's almost like it's always extended family so we we also were the clashing of old old uh, traditions you know how do we deal with that in the present day of of how do we deal with this new uh relationship that is taking on uh the uh, colonial paradigm because that family has fallen um fallen for it i don't want to say that but i do kind of uh has believed or has stopped believing in in our ways in uh in more of a uh, in a way where we can exist with nature more peacefully uh and that might mean uh you know kind of not being friends with anybody anymore <laughs> in a personal case because because I, I i say things very honestly and truthful and at the end of the day uh you feel alone because when you're uh you give up trying to fit in uh but at the same time it allows people to find their path i was able to find my own path 
and uh, I'm thankful for all the opportunities that I've had with, with new people in my life like yourself. Uh, but it, it becomes that spiritual journey at the end of the day, honestly. And, and then waking up again and, and being able to say, I'm going to choose that higher path today uh, and, and kind of honor all the ancestors, all my family, extended family that have passed before me that have also done the same thing, which is why we're still here. Otherwise, you know, that the government did really want to get rid of their, their native problem. And yeah. that's like, that's crazy, honestly. I, I, I feel like it's just, it's really crazy. It <laughs> and, is. And it so is. when we can come back to plants, you know, it's a gift. <laughs> okay? yeah. Like it's a little gift where I can see the light again. And, and I think maybe that might be a good tool for a lot of people in the future because I don't, I don't suspect it'll get any easier. No, and I think we're now at a critical place where those of us that have that knowledge about the plants are going to be the ones leading others because we see how much of the land has been destroyed and really the only way to heal is to bring back more of nature we need to instill uh indigenous plant life into more places not invasive species and not uh, populate a city with Japanese florals when there are so many indigenous uh, plants that naturally grow. Like that's what we go through here in Vancouver. Everybody wants Japanese uh, trees everywhere. And it's like, really? We're, we're in a place where we're technically, Vancouver is technically a rainforest <laughs> that was deforested. And, you know, if you put back indigenous trees around the land, it's going to fix everything. It'll fix the earth, it'll fix the air. Uh, the pollinators will actually have, like we have all these Japanese uh, cherry trees that everybody's like, oh, but we love in the spring after the winds hit and the, the, pink, the pink snow. So like all these flowers come out, they're beautiful, but there's, there's literally zero nutrients in those flowers. There's no nectar. So all these bees are flying around looking for food and birds too, and they're not getting anything from them. So they're actually dying <laughs> because they have no food, <laughs> but everybody wants it to look pretty. So it's, you know, we have a lot of people in this city that fight for a, a certain look. Uh, so this summer, the the coyotes were being fed by people and they started attacking people. So that then when I went back to Montreal, literally the day I left, they were culling all of the coyotes in the park. And I was like, so upset. <laughs> I was like, I can't even do anything about it. And then people are like, well, we just want our park back. I'm like, I'm just actually going to intervene here and say that park was my people's uh, village sites. Okay. I'm going to, name all the village sites. And then I did that and people were like, oh, <laughs> I'm like, we were killed and pushed out, but we're still here. So you get rid of those coyotes. Guess what? They're coming back. I just want you all to know their ancestors will send more back here. You'll still have coyotes. <laughs> like, Stop feeding them. <laughs> stop trying to humanize your relationship with the wild beasts in the forest because they don't want to have a relationship with you coyotes are like in their natural ways they're terrified of humans they don't want to interact with us they don't need to be fed they are you know the mice and rats you all complain about they eat them you get rid of the coyotes you're going to have mice and rats all winter these are there's a cause and effect for everything so in the end we do really need to deepen our relationship whether we're in urban environments or out in the bush i went to the mountains this weekend and this woman like literally tiniest woman she's up to my shoulders and i am not tall you know that <laughs> so <laughs> i stand next to you i'm i think i'm at your shoulders so this woman's at my shoulders <laughs> and she set up a, a camp uh, in the middle of a logging road and over six years she stopped the logging and i'm like if this wow. little woman in her 50s can just say stop, <laughs> like, 
she made that happen, you know, and she's fueled by her ancestors. Her, her elders all tell, told her they want her there. People check up on her. We went up with a group of people and built some structures for her this weekend that she needed that she couldn't do on her own. And, uh, and just hung out by the campfire laughing at night. And she was like, that was like the most magical thing that, you know, she could just fall asleep to us laughing around the fire and, Aww. and just, you know, having, having that presence there, but she literally has held it down for six years by herself up there. And she just stops all the loggers and makes them check in and check out. And they're only allowed to do the work that is there to kind of minimalize the impact of stealing what's left but she lets everybody know that it's you know that they're all accountable miners wow. came in we were taking samples she's like oh can i see those samples they look she's like looking at them and walks away they're like can we have our samples back it's probably like and they're all top executives of this mining thing she's like oh no i asked you for it you gave it back you're not taking even <laughs> a sample of our land with you <laughs> Okay, so, you know, when we think, what is one person going to do to make a difference? We, we have to understand, like you, Valerie, you're making a difference in your community. This woman, Christine, she's making a difference in her community. Everything we do, whether we're in the urban environment or on the land, the things we do that we know that are important to our heart and mind to change things, that's our inspiration. And if we're brought there, our ancestors nudged us there. And our, yeah. we're doing the work we're doing because it's not just about us, not just about one person. It's about the impacts we're making for everybody around us. And um, yeah, and I think, I think we've been at this for an hour, so <laughs> I don't want to take your whole day, but I honestly could talk to you for hours about all of these things. And I, I really, truly am inspired by the work you're doing and so grateful that you, uh, that you allowed yourself to be chosen to do this work, you know, that you were led to it for whatever reason your spirit called you and that I could see the difference you're making in the lives of younger people in your community and, and I can see that it's lifting you up. I could see the medicine it's giving you and uh, and just I hear it in the pride in your voice of what you do and how uh, how you feel like you're in the right place at the right time. So my hands are up to you and I, I really um, just cannot say enough uh, good good medicine to you of what you do and anything that that you, put on your path to give to your next generation. You're already there. You're on that path, so keep going. And just want to encourage you and, and let you know if you ever have questions or just need to vent, like uh, I'll be your Western uh, <laughs> auntie that you can call up. Be like, I just awesome. gotta say this. <laughs> I'm mad awesome. about this, or I'm happy about this. Like, I'm here. I'm your sounding board. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. My heart is is uh, is so lifted again. So thank you very much. Yeah. Well, thanks for giving us this time today, and and thanks for your beautiful plants. You uh, you uh, helped us to bring to those nice boxes that people enjoyed all summer. People were, the few times I was able to be around there, the questions that came up and the interest and the different uh, things that were growing there it was just, I think it really was good medicine for a lot of people. We planted a bunch of tobacco and a lot of people came and, and were like, well, I can take these seeds home and grow them. And they were so excited. and. Nice. You know, and they're learning about the little trees that we got from you, and they were just fascinated by, you know, the fact that these trees are indigenous to that area. And so all of those things, it was, it just created a lot of learning and a lot of um, depth of understanding that people needed. So it was good medicine. It definitely was. And thank you. Thank you again to um, Mode uh, from Momenta. Yeah, come and, back, uh, Mode. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> have your face back. There you are. I'm like almost crying, so I cannot really talk. But thank you so much, both of you, for that. It's like just, just wonderful to hear you. Yeah, I will cry. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and then um, Valerie will um, will send you an email with the specifics about those boxes, and then we'll yes. see. So many yeah. great. And, and I will. The texting works. I love the text. Okay, so. texting is good. I'll text. <laughs> text. You've been so patient. <laughs> um, you've been we'll send an email with the letter, but we'll text you, and texting works great for us too. <laughs> Thank yeah, you so, so much, both of you, for, for that wonderful conversation. And uh, yeah, I cannot thank you enough. Thank you. Uh, it was, <laughs> I was like so excited. I'm like, yay, I get to have a conversation <laughs> with Valerie while she's in her busy learning week. And no, I'm, I was really good. I, I knew how hard it was when I came back in September and I should have realized ahead of time, September is going to be chaotic for you. And you're no longer just out at uh, Vanasatagi, but you're coming back and forth and school is a whole other world. <laughs> yeah, it was so challenging and I didn't even know how challenged I was in that, in those moments. <laughs> Honestly, I didn't. So yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I tapped myself on the shoulder after the big wave went down. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was, it was really hard. <laughs> Thank I'm glad so we could much. make this happen. Yeah, this this was you. a really good way for us all to at least get to have a conversation. And yeah. again, just really, I can't appreciate, I can't tell you how much I appreciate this conversation, but also the, the work that we got to do this summer and being on your land. It just uh, was so uplifting for me. I felt like I had met such a, incredible human being and your family your community so hands are up thank you so much and it's the same for you as well yeah I'm giving you virtual hugs here i'm hugging you but it's that with uh, my daughter like when we yeah. <laughs> yeah we do that too okay well one day we you and me and our daughters will all get to actually meet each other in other ways i hope we will we'll